Assalamu alaikum students welcome back to your American literature class and um, in this class um, what we are going to be doing today is um, a story by Zora Neale Hurston. Now um, this is a very interesting story um, and um, I'd like to give you a little background to the story before we start with uh, the text. I'm not going to uh, recap what we did in the last lecture. Like I told you in the last lecture, these are separate texts that we are dealing with. Since they are not in continuation, um, what I'm trying to do is to give you uh, as broad um, an introduction to American literature as it is possible. Um, in the first uh, few lectures, we did the essay on self-reliance by Emerson. And um, now we're on to um, doing um, short stories. Uh, we did do some short stories in um, our prose B paper. But this is specifically a module on American literature. Uh, and um, the last lecture that we had was um, where I had given you a chapter out of um, Mark Twain's novel, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. And that chapter was a whole in itself. You know, I gave you the background for that. Um, so uh, let me give you a little of the background for um, this story. Now, Zora Neale Hurston is one of um, the uh, most prominent African-American writers uh, and um, she is a very uh, famous writer in the sense that she is a part of the Harlem Renaissance which was a revival of uh, African-American uh, literature, African-American uh, music and African-American arts. So whether it is performance arts or the fine arts or the liberal arts, African Americans um, have made and are continuing to make um, a wonderful contribution as far as um, their presence in uh, the United States is concerned. So a lot of what you see um, in present day United States is because of the Harlem Renaissance which was a movement uh, in the world of literature uh, and uh, the arts uh, and in which African Americans uh, made uh, maximum contribution um, to the world of art, to the world of literature. Zora Neale Hurston uh, is uh, one of um, the few female writers. So um, Moses Man of the Mountain is one of the, um, the most uh, famous novels and she's written Mules and Men. She has a collection of um, short stories, etc., etc. Um, basically, she is writing about African Americans and their situation in the United States. Um, so she's bringing up issues of African Americans uh, as uh, a part of um, the wider American landscape and she's also writing about African American communities and how there is um, a difference in the approach and attitude of different groups within that uh, community. Uh, this is titled, How It Feels to be Colored, Me. Um, you know that uh, African American is the politically correct term now. They have been called blacks, they've been called Negroes, they've even been called niggers, which was a very derogatory word and which you cannot use in the United States now. Uh, and um, they are, as a group, they have been marginalized, um, having been brought as slaves from uh, the African continent. Uh, they have also been called colored. So this um, uh, story that I'm going to be doing with you today uh, is uh, autobiographical. And uh, it is titled, How It Feels to be Colored Me. And it's very interesting because it tells you 
uh, the workings of a little girl's mind and how she is made to realize that she is different from the um, the other people around her just because uh, her complexion is of a different color so um, it addresses the race issue uh, in the United States and um, tells us what it feels like to be a colored person <coughs> So uh, let us um, go on with the text. I am colored, but I offer nothing in the way of extenuating circumstances except the fact that I am the only Negro in the United States whose grandfather on the mother's side was not an Indian chief. Now, Zora Neale Hurston's style is such that um, she evokes humor uh, and she is also sarcastic. Now the time at which she was writing, uh, people in the United States had started to um, realize that there was such a thing as an American Indian. Um, for, uh, for decades, for centuries, the American Indians were marginalized and then in the 20th century, all of a sudden, people started to realize that it wasn't such a bad thing to have American Indians as ancestors because um, those were the original inhabitants of the Americas. Um, so with the uh, passage of time, this realization grew stronger and it became a fashion to... Uh, to belong to a tribe. Um, it became a fashion to claim that you were uh, a descendant of an Indian. But where um, Zora Neale Hurston is particularly sarcastic is that everyone claims to be a descendant of a chief. Nobody says that we were descendants of ordinary Indians. Because, you know, ordinary Indians are not, um, not, not exciting, not uh, interesting enough. <clears throat> but Indian chiefs with that stereotype that uh, had been created uh, were very interesting because they had this power and they had wisdom uh, and um, they were very serious. Uh, so this stereotype that was created of the tribal chief uh, led people to claim ancestry uh, from a particular tribal chief. And this thing became especially fashionable in the African American community um, because people didn't want to um, be known as uh, <clears throat> descendants of slaves but since they were their complexions were dark they thought that since the American Indians were also dark they could claim ancestry there and explain their dark color so when Zora Neale Hurston says that I am the only Negro in the United States who is not descendant descended from um, an Indian chief um, she is hitting out at um, this, uh, fa th this fashion or this fad that um, African Americans were very fond of promoting. So she says, I am the only Negro in the United States who is not descended from an Indian chief. I remember the very day that I became colored. So again, very sarcastic because she was born colored and yet she says I remember the very day that I became colored up to my 13th year I lived in the little Negro town of Eatonville Florida it's exclusively a colored town now when she was living in an, uh, a colored town she was like the other people she was the same complexion she had the same features um, she had the same crinkly hair and, um, and, and facial features and complexion 
um, that the other inhabitants of the town had. So she was no different. And because she was the same, so she wasn't made to feel uh, that she was colored. Since everyone else was also colored. So he says, up to my 13th year, I lived in Eatonville, Florida. And that was a small town. It was a colored town. So in a colored town, um, I was the same as everybody else. The only white people I knew passed through the town going to or coming from Orlando. The native whites rode dusty horses. The northern tourists chugged down the sandy village road in automobiles. So the, the only whites that they saw were those who were passing through the town. They were either going to Orlando or they were coming back from Orlando. Um, but the other people, the people um, who lived in the town were all black. So I was the same color, no big deal. The town knew the southerners and never stopped cane chewing when they passed. So they knew um, the, the white Americans who were riding horses and who were going to and from Orlando. Uh, but the northerners were something else again. So you had two groups of people passing through Eatonville um, and on to Orlando. One was those who were coming from the south and these were mostly cowboy types who were riding horses. Um, but those who were coming from the northern states uh, they were different because for one thing they had automobiles or cars as you would call them um, these days uh, and um, so they rode through um, the, the village or the town uh, whatever you call Eatonville uh, and uh, they um, were peered at cautiously from behind curtains you know the northerners were a little scary because they had money they had cars so um, they, uh, they, they, they didn't clo go close to them or try to establish a relationship. The more venturesome would come out on the porch to watch them go past and got as much pleasure out of the tourists as the tourists got out of the village. So, you know, it's equally interesting um, for villagers and for tourists. Tourists look at villagers because it's something that they've not seen. Villagers look out at tourists because that's something that they have not seen. So the northern, uh, the northerners are very interesting because those were two tourists um, going to Orlando. The front porch might seem a daring place for the rest of the town, but it was a gallery seat for me. So you remember, you have this little Zora Neale Hurston, um, even up to her teenage, uh, she lived in Eatonville. So the children, what they would do is, uh, they would come, I, they would either peer from behind curtains and, you know, see those tourists uh, riding by or, um, and the more adventurous would come out on the front porch and uh, enjoy just looking at the tourists, not doing anything, just looking at them. And the tourists in their turn would look at the villagers. So um, the little Zora Neale Hurston uh, was in the habit of placing herself on the front porch and um, seeing the world go by. My favorite place was atop the gate post. So there was this gate and there was the gate post and she would just sit there uh, and um, consider that she was in a theater and it was the first night, opening night, and she was looking at um, the play of the world, all those people passing by. So not only did she enjoy the show, but she didn't mind the actors knowing that I liked it. So the, the tourists who are passing by, she considers actors. The, the people who are riding on horses, she considers uh, actors. And she addresses them. You know, she's not scared. She would talk to them. She'd wave to them, and when they waved back, she would say something like, How do you well? How do you do? Well, I thank you. Where are you going? Now, those people are not stopping by, they're not even listening to her. But um, she has to utter uh, her uh, welcome phrases. 
Um, usually automobile or the horse paused at this and after a queer exchange of compliments I would probably go a piece of the way with them as we say in farthest Florida. So um, the only um, things that um, she would um, uh, she, she would get a, a real kick out of is addressing the people who were going. So she thinks that she's being very um, welcoming because remember she's in the south and um, the southern states were very um, famous for their hospitality. So she sort of, uh, she, she thinks that she's in the position of welcoming these people to uh, Eatonville. And she says that if um, the, the car or the horse stopped, she would walk a little way with the horse or with the car um, just to give them company because she thinks she's being very hospitable. If one of my family happened to come to the front in time to see me, of course negotiations would be rudely broken off. And you know they would say that, um, come back home, what are you doing there, don't disturb strangers. Uh, but she considered herself as a kind of ambassador to the South and I hope the Miami Chamber of Commerce will please take notice because she is um, the first person to welcome them to Florida. So the Chamber of Commerce needs to acknowledge uh, her services. During this uh, time, white people differed from color to me only that they rode through town and never lived there. So she doesn't look at their complexions. All that she sees is that these are people who are not living in the town, but who are just passing through. They like to hear me speak pieces. They um, enjoyed hearing um, the, the, the young Zora Neale Hurston. And uh, so she would sing and she would dance. Uh, and, and she thought that she was being very welcoming but of course her family didn't like it and if one of the family members happened to come out onto the front porch uh, Zora Neale Hurston had to cut short her act and go back in. So um, sometimes these people would give her coins you know because they thought that she was being very sweet in uh, putting up these performances uh, for them. What they didn't realize is that she enjoyed doing it. It wasn't that she was doing it for the money. She was doing, for, doing it for the fun of it. Um, so um, she, she wasn't doing it for the money. She didn't want to take their money, but sometimes they sort of thrust the money uh, onto her. And that's another difference between uh, white people and black people that she notices at this time. She says only the white people gave me money. The colored people had no dimes. Um, and another thing that uh, differentiated the whites and the coloreds was that the colored people didn't really want to enjoy life. Um, and, uh, and especially so they didn't like my performing for the white people. But I was still a part of their community and um, I was, as she says, their Zora. So um, she, she belonged to them, she belonged to this whole community uh, and she was a very um, loving and a lovable person. But changes came uh, in the family when I was 13 and I was sent to school in Jacksonville. So from Eatonville she had to go to Jacksonville. She had to leave Eatonville, um, the town of the Oleanders. See this beautiful uh, name that she gives to her town, a beautiful description. Uh, and when she got off the riverboat at Jacksonville, she was not the Zora of Eatonville anymore. It seemed that I had suffered a sea change because Jacksonville was not uh, a colored town. I was not Zora of Orange County anymore. I was now a little colored girl. So this is when she finds out that she is different from the people in Jacksonville and she is colored. 
I found it out in certain ways, and these are some of the ways that she um, explains. In my heart, as well as in the mirror, I became a fast brown, warranted not to rub nor run. So she's brown in color, and the color is fast. The color is not going to run, it's not dyed, she is really brown. So she gets a chance to look at herself in the mirror, she gets a chance to look at herself through other people's eyes. And these are people who may be white or who may be a different complexion from her otherwise. But I am not tragically colored. There is no great sorrow dammed up in my soul nor lurking behind my eyes. So um, this change that, uh, that takes place, takes place not in Zora herself, but in the eyes of um, those who are looking at Zora. This change takes place in their attitude, in their behavior, in their speech. And it's the they who start calling her the little colored girl. Previously, she'd just been called Zora. Now, she's called the little colored girl. And she says, my color was not tragic. You know, again, another stereotype of um, American Indians was that uh, they had some great sorrow. There was some pain. Um, that was hidden in their hearts. And um, Zora Neale Hurston says that I was not tragically colored and there was no sorrow hidden in my heart. I do not mind at all. I do not belong to the sobbing school of Negrohood who hold that nature somehow has given them a low down dirty deal and whose feelings are all but about it. Even in the helter skelter skirmish that is my life, I have seen that the world is to the strong, regardless of a little pigmentation, more or less. So she has a very forward uh, looking um, attitude. She doesn't want to cry about her situation, she doesn't want to mourn about it, she just wants to get up and do something. Um, and she says there are a lot of people who say, you know, because we are black, we were brought as slaves uh, and our ancestors uh, were tortured and they were killed and um, they had to do a lot of work. Uh, and so, you know, we can't do any work. She says, I am not at all like those people who go around crying and who go around sobbing and say um, that... Um, they, they have bad luck because nature uh, made them slaves and now that they are um, the children of the children of slaves, they still have that stigma attached to their names. So um, Hurston says that I do not feel that I have been marginalized. I do not feel that I have been um, in any way punished for my sins. So I do not weep at the world. I am too busy sharpening my oyster knife. So Hurston's approach towards life is to get the maximum out of life. Her, to her, the world is like an oyster. She needs a knife in order to open up the oyster and to scoop up the meat to enjoy whatever is in the oyster. So for her, life is like an oyster. It's not um, a bed of thorns. She knows there's good in life and she is all set to um, get as much from life as it is possible for her to. So I do not always feel colored. If, every, even now, I often achieve the unconscious Zora of Eatonville before the Hijra. I feel most colored when I'm thrown against a sharp white background. So um, Hurston makes a reference to um, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's Hijrat when she says that um, 
I, when I migrated from Eatonville to Jacksonville, it brought about a major change in my life. Just as the Hijrat is supposed to have brought about a major change um, in the life of all Muslims. Um, so um, she says, you know, even now there are times when my color is not perceived, uh, but it is most perceived when I am in the company of predominantly white people. She calls it a sharp white background. For instance, at Barnard, beside the waters of the Hudson, I feel my race. So there are particular places where she feels her race. Among the thousand white persons, I am a dark rock, surged upon and overswept, but through it all, I remain myself. So. I am thrown against a sharp white background. There are a thousand white people around me. And yet I am like a rock that is steadfast. I do not move from my place. When covered by the waters, I am and the ebb but reveals me again. So I do not go anywhere. I am like the rock that is covered by water and which for the time being is concealed. But when the waters ebb, I am there, I am solid, and I cannot be changed, no matter what names you give me, no matter what titles um, you may give me. Sometimes it's the other way around. A white person is set down in our midst, but the contrast is just as sharp for me. So it's the same thing. You know, you have a white person coming to a black com community or a black person going to a white community. The contrast is uh, as sharp. When I sit in the drafty basement, that is the New World Cabaret with a white person, my color comes. Again, Hurston uses this technique of ebb and flow, coming and going. She, um, sh she installs movement. She puts in a lot of movement here. And uh, it's like there are times when she's colored and there are times when she's white. Uh, when she is against a white background in the company of white people, then she becomes colored. But if she is in the company of her own people, then she is white because white cannot be seen. White light cannot be perceived. So um, she cannot be differentiated then. But when she is in the company of white people, then definitely yes, as she says, color comes. It's not color uh, that changes. It's perception that changes. So um, she, um, she enjoys being black. Uh, she likes being colored because she belongs to a particular group and it depends on her situation in society uh, whether she is uh, colored or uh, white. So uh, when, um, when, when she is told that she is uh, colored, um, she, uh, she, she, she starts thinking of what difference that makes uh, between her and another girl of, um, of the same age. So she says, I follow those heathen Heathens, savages, the title that um, she's given by white people. Um, white people who do not want to acknowledge the African Americans as an integral part of uh, mainstream society. So she says, you know, um, I, I'm not uh, bothered with what people say about me. If people say I'm mad to dance, well, I dance anyway. Uh, I yell, I whoop, I uh, shake my essay guy above my head, whatever stereotypes they establish, I reinforce them because I like it that way. And I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Uh, if they say that I live in the jungle, well, I live in the jungle and I have jungle ways and then they cannot blame me for anything. Uh, if they say that I am doing dances all the time and, um, and that I do not know civilization, well, then I conduct myself accordingly. I dance a lot and I don't show um, the effect of um, civilization. 
My pulse is throbbing like a war drum. I want to slaughter something, give pain, give death. To what? I do not know. But the piece ends. So when she hears music, she wants to dance. And if people say, you know, she's like a savage. See, she, she, that's what I was telling you about. These are people who have no civilization, who have no refinement. Look at her. She's dancing to music. So Zora Neale Hurston says, yes, I dance because I like to dance. I, I dance because it makes you upset. And I like that. So whatever they say she's guilty of, she will go and do that. She'll go and do it and then get money from those people who give her um, titles. So when the music comes to an end, um, Zora Neale Hurston creeps back slowly to the veneer we call civilization with the last tone and find the white friend sitting motionless in his seat, smoking calmly. So, um, if, she's, uh, if, if she's told that she's savage, if she's told that she's not refined, um, she enjoys that, she likes it, and she will, uh, she will be crude, she will be uncivilized, she'll dance and she'll hoop and uh, she'll say yee-haw and uh, yeow, she'll, she'll scream because that's what people expect of her. And so she says, I don't want to disappoint them. I, I like being who I am. I like being what I am. And I want people to acknowledge me for what I am and uh, for what I can do, not for what other people can do or have done um, in the years past. So. Uh, she says, I'm not bothered if there are people who are just listening to music and drumming on the table. I don't like such people, but I'm not bothered with them. I hear music, I want to dance. I hear music, I dance. So, um, so, so it's music that um, really moves her, and um, which Hurston calls great blobs of purple and red emotion. So she says, a person who is just sitting, drumming his um, fingers on the table is an individual who has only heard what I, the dancer, the savage, have felt. He's far away and I see him but dimly across the ocean and the continent that have fallen between us. So when a white man or a white woman calls me colored and calls me savage that is when he says I feel superior I feel as if I am removed from that person and I belong to a totally different um, civilization so um, and, and it's not just that uh, Hurston is colored it's that um, the the so-called white American is pale um, and, and this reminds me of uh, a poem which was uh, shared and which is shared very frequently where uh, a black uh, child calls out and he says uh, you know I'm not the one who's colored you're the one who's colored because um, you are red when you're born when you fall ill, you become yellow. Uh, when you get angry, you become uh, red. And uh, when you die, you become white. So you're the one who changes color. I don't change color. I stay black. You change color. And therefore, you are to be blamed. Therefore, you are everything that you tell me that I am. So um, it's not that uh, it's not I who's colored. I retain the same color in sickness and in health um, in in Africa and in America, uh, on the moon and on Mars. I remain the same. It's the white people who change color. At certain times, she says, "I have no race. I am me." So, um, she says, at certain times I have no race, I am me, Zora Neale Hurston. 
when I set my hat at a certain angle and saunter down 7th Avenue, Harlem City, feeling as snooty as the lions in front of the 42nd Street Library, for instance. So far as my feelings are concerned, Peggy Hopkins Joyce on the bull Mitch with her gorgeous raiment, stately carriage, knees knocking together in a most aristocratic manner has nothing on me. So Zora Neale Hurston is full of confidence. Even the little girl, the 13-year-old, um, who is made to feel colored uh, when she moves from Eatonville to Jacksonville, um, she feels very confident of herself. Now what you see here is a Zora Neale Hurston that is full of confidence, um, full of energy, full of the will to live. And she says, you know, when I put my hat on and I want to take a walk, I may be living in Harlem City, uh, but when I um, walk in town, uh, nobody can compare with me. I am the most beautiful, the most confident girl, and all those beauties that you see uh, on billboards and um, on uh, signboards, they have nothing to compare with me. I am the best. I am Zora. As she says, the cosmic Zora emerges. The one who rules the world emerges. And in her opinion, it's Zora Neale Hurston who rules the world. When you're a 13-year-old and um, you are full of life, you are healthy, you are strong, then the world is at your feet. I belong to no race nor time. I am the eternal feminine with its string of beads. So she says, I am a woman and I feel very strong and full of life when I um, think of myself and when I think of my situation. She says, I have no separate feeling about being an American citizen and colored. I am merely a fragment of the great soul that surges within the boundaries, within the boundaries of the United States. So my country, right or wrong, she is uh, an American. She does not call herself an African American. She does not call herself a black American or a Negro. She says, I am an American. And um, within this geographical area, that is the United States of America, I feel young, I feel confident, uh, I am full of life. And um, I have absolutely no hesitation in telling the whole world that I am the greatest being that there is. I am the cosmic Zora. When I go out for a walk, I'm full of confidence and I can take on the whole world um, and not uh, feel that I am being discriminated against. I, um, I, I feel I'm being discriminated against, but that does not upset me. It merely surprises me. You know, she, that's, she's so full of confidence. Um, she's so full of herself, of life, that she says, how can anyone not appreciate me? How can anyone say bad things about me? I am Zora. I am the cosmic Zora. Uh, so she says, I cannot imagine why people would not feel very happy and excited in my company because to me I am the best that there is but in the main I feel like a brown bag of miscellany propped against a wall. Now this metaphor, um, this comparison with a brown bag um, Hurston is going to discuss in detail and she says you know um, most of the time I feel as if I'm a brown bag, a sack, uh, full of miscellaneous things. And if you overturn this uh, brown bag, uh, you're going to get different things. I'm a brown bag just as there are white bags, there are red bags, um, and um, there are yellow bags. So what she's referring to is the other races in the United States. And um, at the time that um, Hurston was writing, uh, the races that predominated in the US were the American Indians, the African Americans, um, the Euro-Americans, 
and the Asian Americans. Um, those are the ones um, that she calls yellow. So uh, she says, you know, I don't feel strange. Um, I feel as if um, I'm like a bag, but I'm in the company of other bags. I am black and I am with people who are red, people who are yellow and people who are white. So we're, we're all living together. There's um, no big deal. And if you overturn the bag, um, some of the contents that are going to drop out are going to be what? A first water diamond, an empty spool, bits of broken glass, lengths of string, a key to a door long since crumbled away, a rusty knife blade, old shoes saved for a road um, that never was and never will be, a nail bent under the weight of things too heavy for um, any nail, a dried flower or two, still a little fragrant. So she says, you know, I'm, I'm no different from other girls of my age. I have the same desires. I have the same um, things that I get excited about. Um, maybe I have more of one thing and less of another, but that doesn't uh, make me very different from others around me because if I'm a brown bag, then the others are red bags, white bags, and uh, yellow bags. And um, regardless of uh, the color of our skin, uh, we have the same body makeup, we have the same organs, we have the same mind. Um, we, um, we, we are no different um, from, from each other. Uh, and it's up to the individual how he or she uh, treats another individual. So if you treat me right, if you use me in a positive manner, I will benefit you. But if you point out my shortcomings and weaknesses and do not let me perform to my best, uh, I am I am useless to you uh, because I am made up of all these um, different things that I have told you about. I have ideas, I have desires, I have ambitions, I have experience. Uh, and if out of all these you do not require any particular aspect, well, I can put that on the back burner for the time being and concentrate on uh, what you want me to do. So um, she says all of these bags and she carries the comparison with the bags um, a little further and she says all these bags, the, the, the brown, the, um, the yellow, the red and the white, they have been stuffed with certain features. Uh, God Almighty or the Divine Spirit or the Divine Being has put in all of us desire, ambition, um, looks, health, um, and, and so many other things. But in some, there is a greater quantity of one particular uh, feature and a smaller quantity of another. Uh, our color has nothing to do with it. Inside we are all equal. We have the same amount of ambition. We have the same amount of desire. Maybe somewhere you have more ambition, less desire. Somewhere you have more intelligence um, and uh, less common sense. Um, some you might have other differences. But in the main we are all the same. There's no difference between uh, a person who has a white complexion and a person who has a yellow or uh, a brown or a black complexion. But he says the, well, what is troubling and uh, what uh, bothers is that someone is always there at my elbow reminding me that I am the granddaughter of slaves. So what? I am not concerned with that. She says, it fails to register depression with me. I don't feel depressed because I am the granddaughter of slaves. Slavery is 60 years in the past. The operation was successful and the patient is doing well. Thank you. So, you know, Hurston has her way of um, explaining things. And she says that with the Emancipation Proclamation, 
uh, we got our freedom um, and this freedom is almost as if um, a diseased organ has been operated upon and thrown out of the body she says the operation was successful the patient is recovering nicely um, the descendants of slaves are not slaves they are free men women and children the terrible suggestion that made me an American out of a potential slave said on the line so with the Emancipation Proclamation with equal rights being given um, to African Americans uh, Hurston says that I found uh, my goal in life uh, the era of reconstruction said get set get ready uh, and the generation before Hurston's made many sacrifices with the Harlem Renaissance with the African American movement uh, the generation of African Americans uh, before uh, that of Hurston uh, gave the command go and uh, outlined a road map that um, this is what has to be done we are no different from the others around us we are not uh, the descendants of slaves we are free people this is our homeland and we are going to make the best of the time and the opportunity given to us so um, Hurston says that what stays in my mind is that command go go and perform go and do go and build that is what um, stays in my mind not the um, snide remarks of people saying oh but you your uh, grandfather or your ancestors were slaves I'm not bothered with that slavery is over and done with and I am the, the generation that is going to perform that's going to deliver so um, I'm not the kind of person who's going to weep because my great-grandfather was a slave on a ship I am just not going to think about that period at all I am concerned with the future and with the present the past has helped me to come to this present and my present will take me into the future it's a bully adventure and worth all that I have paid through my ancestors for it no one on earth ever had a greater chance for glory so as an American she says I have the greatest chance for glory the world is to be won and there is nothing to lose it is thrilling to think to know that for any act of mine I am going to get double the credit and she gets credit because she is the descendant of slaves and therefore she has to work less hard than those who are the descendants of the masters she says that I have um, I have absolutely no qualms about going ahead and performing to my best because my position is strong anything that I do is going to be magnified anything that uh, I um, study for is going to get double the credit um, if you have a Colin Powell you get credit for for, for going ahead and uh, and for uh, doing so um, uh, so much for your country if you have a Condoleezza Rice oh you're wonderful because you're a woman you're black and you know you have uh, assumed such a wonderful position if you have uh, a, a President Obama uh, that is double the credit of an uh, of a non-black president so he's wonderful not because of uh, what he's doing he's wonderful because of his color so whenever we, we, we think about um, a person who whom we call colored uh, we give them double uh, the um, double the credit so Hurston says that I 
have I have this world on a plate I am young I am strong um, I am healthy uh, I have a lot of knowledge I am educated and so whatever I do I am going to get double the credit that my um, white neighbor is going to get because I'm black so I'm not worried I'm not going to um, go weeping uh, I'm not going to feel sad or regretful about my past yes my ancestors were slaves but I have paid enough for that whatever I get now is mine the world is mine and I'm not going to let anyone forget it so you see a very very positive message um, in this story and if we were to recap it um, quickly you would see that um, it brings a, a positive message for uh, not just the African Americans but for all the um, so-called colored races um, within the United States and outside you know this is a story that I particularly like because it has such an upbeat uh, mood um, Hurston feels excited as uh, a young girl because um, she's full of life she's healthy she has a positive attitude and so unlike uh, people around her who are constantly cribbing and uh, and mourning um, for the fact that they are descendants of slaves she says I don't care what my ancestors were what I care about is the here and the now and what I can make for myself is the future I am young I am strong and I do not think of color as a shortcoming that's not a weak point that is something that I have made into a plus point for myself she traces for us um, almost the story of her life uh, and um, she says that you know up to um, the age when I was 13 and I had to uh, go to another town for my education uh, I was not colored in the sense that she lived in a colored town everyone else had the same uh, complexion um, and so nothing bothered her but the moment that she set foot in Jacksonville she changed from being Zora uh, to a little colored girl but the wonderful thing is that she doesn't let that upset me because she says that um, when I went to Jacksonville uh, people were bothered I was not because I took on color only when I was set against a white background if I was with my own people I felt uh, at par with them and um, when I was in the company of white people I felt stronger than them because I had more pigmentation they had no pigmentation um, apart from that everything was the same I'm young and strong I'm healthy um, I have a positive frame of mind and I'm willing to work I'm willing to um, take maximum um, use of this opportunity that has been given me this life that has been given to me so she says I'm not the, the, the sort of person who um, sits down and who weeps uh, I am sharpening my knife because I consider life to be like an oyster an oyster that is closed but in which oyster there is either a pearl or there is meat whatever there is I'm going to use my knife to open up this oyster of life and see what I have I'm going to work for it I'm going to try for it I'm going to struggle for it and I don't want any favors just because of my pigmentation I am ready for all the challenges that come in my way I am willing to face life because I want the best out of life and I am willing to pay the price I have paid the price through my ancestors whatever life holds for me now can only be positive 
I am not going to uh, let people around me dictate to me uh, what I must do, how I must do it, and when I must do it. I am my person. I am the cosmic Zora, and the cosmic Zora is out to take over the entire world, to rule the world as it were. And she says, when I put on my hat, when I go out for a walk, the world is mine. I am not of um, those people who will sit and moan and say, oh, you know, I get no chances, there are no opportunities for black Americans in this country, how can I make any progress? I am full of life, I am full of energy, full of ambition and the desire to uh, experience and to benefit as much from this life on earth as it is possible for any human being to. So she has her plans made out and she says, I'm not going to complain, I'm not going to be moaning about it, I am just going to go ahead and get whatever it is um, that I want in life and I know that it's made easy for me because of my color. It's not made difficult because whatever I do, no matter how, um, no matter how small it is, I will still get double the credit because people will say, oh, but she's an African-American and you know she's doing such wonderful work. So she gets credit of, um, uh, of, of doing less work than her white neighbor. You see, she, she has a very different approach towards life. And her approach is that African Americans have these wonderful opportunities. They, even if they do a little work, the world praises them and the world says, you know, oh, such and such is a wonderful person. You know, he's an African American and he's done such wonderful work. So it's almost as if they, um, they think that you have to put in double the effort. Whereas according to Hurston, she has to put in half the effort. Her white neighbor, because he's supposed to be the descendant of masters of uh, the black slaves, has to put in double the effort because people think that, oh, you know, he's white. And so he has an edge. Um, so in order to uh, make an impact in the world, a white person, according to Hurston, has to work doubly hard um, because there is always this guilt in the white people that they have, um, that they enslaved the Africans, uh, that they tortured them, subjugated them. And it's almost as if you have a ghost by your side. You are living with the idea of having colonized and having subjugated uh, a free people. And white people have to live with that thought all the time. So when you have a ghost living with you, it's very difficult for you to make progress. It's very difficult for you to perform anything. It's very difficult for you to get ahead in life because you always have that guilt. You always have that um, consciousness that this is a people that you have enslaved. This is a people that your ancestors subjugated. And so you must give them equal opportunity. You must give them extra opportunity. So Hurston says that I have no such ghosts. I am free. I am my own woman. And I do not have to fear any monster. I do not have to fear any ghost. I can just go ahead in life and grab whatever it is 
that is uh, that I consider to be the best so with this positive note I'm going to take my leave in the le next lecture we will inshallah be doing something more as interesting or perhaps more interesting than what we have done today so take care of yourselves do your assignments on time be good students uh, and be patient Allah Hafiz.